Steve, you can start. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Downs. I'm the chair of the board of directors of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar on prosecutorial misconduct. Black Lives Matter and other groups have rightfully shown a spotlight on the racist killings of black citizens by police officers. What is sometimes overlooked is the role that prosecutors play in supporting or suppressing police misconduct. The police and the prosecutors work closely together with the prosecutor's office, deciding what criminal cases deserve prosecution and how they should be prosecuted. Prosecutors are bound by ethical codes of conduct that forbid discrimination on the basis of race or gender or other protected categories. Prosecutors could insist that police officers follow similar ethical rules and could refuse to prosecute cases that are based on discrimination. Too often, however, ethical rules are violated and are ignored. Today, we're going to examine the extraordinary case of Curtis, Flower, uh, Curtis Flowers, a black man who was kept in jail for 23 years by a flagrantly racist prosecution. And we will talk with Alan Bean, the director of Friends of Justice, who advocated to free flowers for some 12 years. We will also speak with Jeffrey Deskovic, a man who spent 16 years in jail for a crime that he did not commit, and who has since become a lawyer and an expert on prosecutorial misconduct and is working to develop meaningful oversight for prosecutors. So Curtis, let's start with you. Uh, just to orient uh, our listeners right now at the beginning uh, about your complicated case, I'm going to try to summarize it in one sentence. So here it goes. Steve, you've muted yourself accidentally. Sorry, there we go, back again. This is what I, I wrote out. Um, after 23 years on death row and after six trials for the same murder charge, uh, the US Supreme Court finally reversed your conviction because of blatant racism by the prosecutor in the jury selection. Does that sound correct? Yeah. And uh, after the reversal, the prosecutor finally agreed to turn your case over to the state's attorney general, is that correct? Right. And after that, the uh, state's attorney general decided not to bring a seventh attempt to convict you. And as a result, dropped all the charges and you are now a free man. Uh, yes. That's great. So um, how long have you been free? Uh, how long have you been out of jail? Well, since December 16th of last year. Of 16th of December? Last December? When I got out on bail. Yeah. So that's about five months, four months? Yes. Yeah. I was, uh, my case was dismissed in, oh, what month was it? September. Okay. September. And, and, and where are you staying right now? Uh, right now I'm living in Madison. Madison. Okay. And that's pretty close to Winona, I guess, right? It's about an hour away. Yes, it is. About an hour away. Okay, so now I want to get down into the details of the case here, what happened. Uh, this case uh, arose out of a brutal murder, 1979, in uh, Winona, where, where you were living, in which uh, four members of a furniture store got murdered. And uh, I gather at that time, you had recently been employed by the store and then had left. And I guess uh, it appears to me that the police uh, thought maybe there was a grudge here going on. It was a, a grudge murder for some reason. Didn't have any reason, I think, to believe that. But they began to bring together bits and pieces of evidence that might support that theory. And that's how you eventually got charged. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. So could you just describe what, what was the evidence against you when, they, when you finally ended up going to trial? It, it, was, it was all circumstantial. Uh... There was nothing direct, no fingerprints or anything like that. Someone say oh, they saw me here. Someone said they saw me there. But everywhere someone said they saw me, I was dressed different. Well, and I gather they, they did one thing. They put out a poster, right? 
uh, reward posting. You know. Yeah, I mean? could you just describe that because that that seemed very unusual to me. Yes, well, uh, in the neighborhood I lived in uh, at that time, you know, they was questioning and, and people see them coming in and get me, you know, to take me in for questioning, you know, and eventually put out a $30,000 reward. And, and what it, was, was, it was like people that didn't know me knew me then. <laughs> you know, yes, I know him. I saw him here. I saw him there. Uh, and, it, and it just, it, it was just ridiculous well the point was that according to this reward they were going to give you the money if that led to the year conviction and their testimony would say i saw him near the furniture store around that time right right yes uh so i mean it's not surprising that a lot of people suddenly claimed that they'd seen you there the, the point was that they all saw you dressed <laughs> in something different right something different. <laughs> a lot a lot of questions about credibility mm -hmm. um there was, um, so anyway, let's uh, focus on the first trial. Uh, when you went to your first trial, how confident were you feeling about the case? Uh, fairly confident until they uh, got the jury seated. <laughs> right, well, I guess we're <laughs> gonna come to that in a sec. Um, when, the, uh, when the prosecutor came in, uh, one of the first things he did was to challenge all of the black jurors, right? Yes, he did. And did your lawyer object to that? Yes, he, yes, they did. And uh, what did he? Oops, wait a minute. And what did he call it? What what phrase did he use in in challenging it? Did he talk? Uh, did he talk uh, about Batson? Yes, yes, yes. All right. right. I remember Good. That. Well, I'm glad we do that because I wanted to just uh, give a little explanation to the people watching this as to what a Batson challenge is because most people don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would sort of help clarify it. Um, the, when uh, selecting jurors, both prosecutors and defense can ask to strike jurors for cause. That's meaning potential bias. But in addition, both sides are given a certain number of preemptory challenges to strike any juror they want for any reason. No questions asked, with, with one exception. No juror can be struck by law from a jury because of their race. After the Civil War, a law was passed making it illegal to exclude anyone from jury service because of their race. Because under the 14th Amendment, everyone was equal before the law. So if a pattern developed in which prosecutors use their peremptory challenges to strike black jurors from the trial, the prosecutors can be required to give race-free explanations as to why the jurors were struck. And if the explanations are not adequate, the, judge, the jurors could not be seated or eventually the verdict could be reversed. And I have to say, just getting to the end of the story here, in the four trials that went to verdict in your case, the prosecutors used their preemptory challenges to strike 41 of the 42 black jurors who were presented. Right? <laughs> So anyway, in this particular case, the prosecutor used the uh, preemptive challenges to strike the black uh, jurors in your case and you were stuck with an all white jury. Yes, I was. How confident at that point did you feel that you were gonna get a fair trial? <laughs> at that point, I didn't, I didn't feel I was gonna get one. Why in particular do you think that was important? Could you talk a little bit about the conditions of race in, in Winona at that time? One owner has always been, uh, it's a small town, you know, and they've always been, in my belief, kind of divided, you know. I will say not not all or, are like that, but it's, it's, it's the majority. And well, I, I gather what you, you're saying is, uh, well, first of all, let me ask you, what is the makeup of Winona in terms of, of race? Is it? Oh, I think it, if I'm not if I'm correct, I think it's forty five percent black. Yes. Yeah, um, it's about that. In other words, it's it's pretty well balanced. There's, there's a certainly a significant black population there. Yes. So that the idea that you would keep coming up with an all white jury would be contrary to what the community really was about. Exactly. So after the uh, trial started, the prosecutor. Uh, apparently felt the need to cut some corners and uh, began to 
comment inappropriately or in, improperly about uh, testimony before the um, before the jury, and I think he also uh, referenced certain statements that were made that had been cut, you know, and excluded. Yes. Uh, did your lawyer object to those? If I recall, if I recall correctly, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I th right. So anyway, as a result of the first trial, uh, what happened? Oh, in the first trial? First trial. Oh, it was. It was bad, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. You, you were convicted and sentenced to, to execution. Yes, yes, I was. Uh, and how did you feel about that? I mean, how? I, I, it's a, it's hard to say how you felt about it, but I'm just trying to get a reaction here. Yeah, well, it, it was a, a, a feeling like I've never had before. <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, to, to, to hear those words, you know, someone who has never been arrested, and uh, it, it was heart dropping. Curtis, I'm getting a little note here. Can you move a little closer to the mic? You're, we want to get you a little bit louder here. Yes, it was it was heart dropping. You know, uh, I felt like my whole world was just shattered. You know. Yeah. Yes, and it 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 it, it was painful. So um, after that, did they move you up to uh, death row? Yes, they did. I left the courthouse, went straight to Parchman Penitentiary. So d describe to us a little bit what's death row like. Oh man, death row is, and I tell people this all the time, death row is like you take the worstest nightmare you ever had and you multiply it times three. Wow. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is just rough, you know? You Are there particular park. things about it that were really particularly awful? Yes, uh, uh, in, the, in the winter time, the heat, the rats, uh, you know, bad food, water, and it, it, it was just, it was just ridiculous. In the summertime, mosquitoes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, were you in up. with other, were you in with other in uh, inmates or were you there all by yourself pretty much most of the time? By yourself on death row. Every, every death row inmate in Parchment is locked to himself. Yeah, and no that's problem. like for 23 hours a day? For 23 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you do to go from, keep from going crazy? Uh, I, I wrote a lot of letters, uh, read the Bible. Uh, when I wasn't doing that, I was watching sports on TV or on the phone talking with family members. But that's a, that's pretty much what you were limited to, right? That's that's it. Now, then, uh, visitation the first and third Tuesday of every month. Now, eventually, your uh, conviction was appealed to the Supreme Court of Mississippi, right? Yes, it was. And uh, they came down with a decision which reversed it because of the misconduct of the prosecutor in describing all of these, uh, ma uh, making uh, improper comments before the jury. Correct. Um, and they, because of that, they didn't get to the Batson issue on the first trial. Yes. <clears throat> so now you had um, a second and a third trial, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those two trials, did the, uh, prosecutor again go and use all of his preemptory challenges to remove black jurors from the from the uh, uh, jury box. Yes, he did. Yeah. And were you convicted in the second and the third trials? I know I was in the second and the third. I want to say it was a hung jury in the third. I don't think it, it was either the third or the fourth trial. He didn't seek the death penalty. Oh. And and it was a hung jury. All right, that was the fourth trial, I think. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the third trial, I believe, uh, they uh, convicted you the third time, and that went up. And again, you were sentenced to death by by the jury. Okay. Um. So, and then again, uh, this time, in the second and third trial, the Mississippi Supreme Court overturned both of those convictions based primarily on the Batson issue, the fact that you were now facing an all white jury yes. and uh, in, in violation, clear violation of the rules that prohibit that. Um, after that, there was two more trials in which uh, we've come the fourth and the fifth, in which I believe the prosecutor ran out of preemptory prosecutions in the course of the 
getting the jury set up. And so he had a, a number of black folks on the jury. Yes. And I think because <laughs> I would have to say you had some black folks on the jury, uh, they became hung juries that you they could not convict. Is that is that uh, what your perception was? That is correct. So it shows the importance of having a non-all white jury. Mm -hmm. That there are going to be different points of view, and uh, they're they're going to view the evidence uh, differently because of their experience in in dealing with these things. So in any event, um, after the fourth, uh, the fifth trials were uh, hung, this was uh, getting about, this is getting close to about eight years after you'd originally, eight, nine years maybe, after you'd been originally um, uh, arrested. Yes. Is that right? Yes, correct. And you'd been on death row this whole time, right? The whole time. All right. So now we come to the, um, uh, the sixth trial, the big important sixth trial. And prior to that, did your defense uh, sort of reach out to some, uh, to Alan Bean and his organization to see what they could do? Yes. 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 And what were they looking for from Alan? Oh, uh, I'm gonna have to let Alan answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but in any event, uh, in part because of their work, did uh, CNN show up for the trial? Did you have yeah. coverage of the trial? I can't call. It, uh, it, there were so many people there, I, I, I can't recall. <laughs> All right. Um, you had a sense, however, that in the sixth trial, there was a lot more interest going in your trial going on? Yes, there was. Yeah. Now, in the sixth trial, um, the prosecutor apparently trying really hard this time to get within the Batson um, decision uh, used up most of his preemptory challenges, and yet with one or one or two preemptory challenges left, he left one black juror on there. So he could tell the appeals court, "I left one black juror on there. I could have challenged him, and I didn't do it." Yes. Uh, do you remember that? Yes, I do. All right. So um, again, they went through the the whole process. The uh, the trial court asked for the prosecutor to give race-free uh, explanation for why they were striking the black jurors. And uh, he provided it and apparently the trial court accepted that. So uh, you were convicted again and again sentenced to death, right? Yes, I was. So at that point, there was an appeal taken up to the uh, Mississippi Supreme Court again. And what happened on the sixth trial? Uh, I think the, the Mississippi Supreme Court confirmed it. Right. Yeah. This time they didn't reverse it. Exactly. Right. And appeal to the higher court. Right. And this must have been a knife in your back. And how did you feel when you got the, the, the news of this? Uh, of them confirming it? Yeah. Oh, it was, it was, it was, I didn't see how they could confirm it and yet reverse the others. Right. I now, just, All right, this is a, a panelist has a question uh, from the audience and it has to do with how you could have six trials for the same thing, charge. Um, and I, I would simply, I think quickly answer if, if you don't mind my, my doing it because I have to move along here. Uh, <laughs> but the double, double jeopardy rule normally bars a subsequent prosecution, but that's only if you're found not guilty. Here you were convicted each time and it was reversed and so these, you could go back and be retried again. That's the whole point of reversing a conviction and going back again. And you can also be retried if you have a, uh, a hung jury. So you happen to have had a long string of reversals, partly because the prosecutor was engaged in blatant racist misconduct in, in the conduct of the trial. So at this point, now you get on to the Supreme Court and uh, what happened up at the Supreme Court? Who, uh, in a case with Bob, by uh, uh, Sherry Lynn Johnson, okay. uh, who did an awesome job. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> and, and later uh, reversed. And, and what did they reverse it on? Was it on the Batson issue? Yes, it was, yes, it was. 
Yeah. And what they were saying, I think, basically, was that if you look at the whole history of this case, six cases had gone up. And in, I think it's uh, out of 40, what do I have here, 46? No, for 42. Out of 42 challenges, or 42 black jurors that had appeared on there uh, over the course of these six trials, the prosecution had struck 41 of them only left one person on when they had preemptive challenges, when they hadn't run out of preemptive uh, challenges. And that I think convinced the Supreme Court that this was gross misconduct on the part of the prosecutor, that uh, no matter how you looked at it, how many race-free arguments he made, you just can't wash away that much of a history of racism. So as a result of that, um, you were then they, the Supreme Court basically said you can go back and be tried again, and maybe this time they'll get it right. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, I don't know how they did, dared do that. But uh, I, what happened to the prosecutor? He stepped away? Yes, he did. Yeah. And turned it over to the attorney general, and then the attorney general decided not to go forward with this. Yes. And this Do you case. think that, that those decisions that they made was in part because of all the, the uh, publicity that had been generated about the case? Hmm. It's hard to say, but it could have been. Uh, could have been. Sorry, what? I said it could have been. It's hard to say. Yeah. Uh, I think it played a role. And yeah. um, now, so thinking back about this whole ordeal, now you're a free man, uh, you can go on with your life. Why did you have to go through six trials with a prosecutor that was willing to flagrantly violate the, um, the, the rules uh, for, to prevent you know, uh, unfair juries and unfair trials? Was there a way to get rid of this prosecutor? Uh, to this day, uh, I, I do not know. <laughs> I Did do you not. ever file a complaint about it? No, I, I not personally didn't. <laughs> Did you talk to your lawyers about it? Did the lawyers have a way of, of doing something about it? Oh, yes, we talked we talked about it. Now, what did they say? How do you get rid of a, a racist prosecutor? And I'm, I'm sure that at some point uh, a motion was filed to to uh, recuse uh, Evans, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the results and stuff, things like that, but uh, yes, I'm still. It seems I'm still apparent grasping, that I'm yeah. still grasping all this this lot of stuff, you know. <laughs> I, I I understand this is all complicated. That's why I'm sort of in, in, injecting myself a little bit into it. But it, it's important to get your feelings about it and how you feel because you're the one going through it. It's your life. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was it was painful. Uh, I've never been through anything like that before. Uh, and to go through it and be locked away for those that many years, you know, it was, it takes a lot from you. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I know I can't even imagine. I, actually, to be honest with you, it just seems like a, a nightmare I can't even imagine. Yes, it, it takes a lot from you. And, uh, and now, that you're a, now that you're a free man, would you want to live in Winona? Would you like no. to go back and live in Winona? No. And, and why is that? Uh, I, I I could never, I could never live in one owner again. Yes, I I uh, I used to think the world of one owner, you know, growing up, and to be in something like this and to see people not recognize me as me, you know, and I I, I could never do it again. Yes. One owner is a place that I'm in, I visit family, and I'm back out. <laughs> All right, I got it. Yeah. Um, I understand now that you have, in the meantime, you're engaged to be married. Yes, I am. Uh, when's, when's that going to happen? Uh, March 20th. March 20th. Well, congratulations. I think we're just thrilled. I must say I'm amazed at how easily you seem to be adapting to the outside world getting out. This is a very difficult transition to make. I think for anybody who's been in prison, they will know how difficult it is. Yes, I, I believe, you know, having a, a, a large family who's loving, supportive, you know, it's been 
it made it easier, you know? Right. Yeah. So what do you want to do now that you have been given back a life, basically? What are you going to, what do you plan to do? Well, I, it's hard to say what the future holds, but I just want to be happy, you know? Yeah. Right. Settle down and just, just, just be at peace. That yeah. sounds good. Um, mm -hmm. When we talked the last time, you sort of mentioned the foundation. Yes, I want to. I want to start my own foundation. And what what would you like to do with the foundation? I, I would like to start by you know helping put law uh, law students into school. Uh, eventually, uh, be able to help inmates who are in the same situation I was in. You know, to afford good attorneys, uh, investigators, stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to be meeting Jeffrey Deskovic, who was almost in exactly the same situation and set up his own foundation to do that. So I think the two of you might have a good conversation together. <laughs> Just to have one other thing that I, I wanted to mention, uh, everybody has commented on your beautiful singing voice. Oh, and I, I kind of like to think of you up there in um, on death row with nothing to do and, and just singing. And uh, I just wonder, could you give us, could you sing something for us? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a verse. So. Give me a verse. I've had some good days. I've had some heels to climb. I've had some weary days and some lonely nights. But when I look around, and I think things over all of my good days. I weigh my bad days and I, I, I won't complain. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for doing that. I, uh, I think it sends a lot about you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, so I'm going to move on now uh, to uh, Alan Bean. Alan, you there? Yes. Okay, and uh, maybe I could describe you as a, re a retired Baptist preacher yeah, and, a, and, a, and a teller of injustice stories. Yes, that's, that's my primary role in all of this, is to get the story together and tell it in an organized and compelling way. And you sort of took this on after you retired from the ministry? Well, um, <laughs> my retirement from the ministry uh, had a lot to do with the fact that I got involved in this work in the first place, which <laughs> in the Texas panhandle was not popular. And it basically uh, closed that door. Uh, there was no way I was gonna get another church. Um, and, and then I started getting requests uh, from here and there and, and everywhere and it just one case led to another and uh, 21 years later uh, I'm still doing it. <laughs> so um, I gather uh, you've described the your organization the Friends of Justice as a network of advocates who identify injustice stories that need to be told. Would that be a way you could perhaps describe it? Yes, we don't try to do everything. I'm not an attorney and so I do not uh, Invey on the legal side of things. Uh, I think Curtis could probably identify with that. Uh, so you have to know what your lane is. Um, my my goal is to um, first of all get the story down, and to do that, of course, you you have to do a lot of talking to Curtis. Curtis and I uh, corresponded back and forth. Uh, I talked to his mother Lola and his dad Archie and his family. Um, and to various, I mean, as he said, he has a, an extended family and they were more than happy uh, to answer all the questions I had um, and to introduce me to people they thought I should talk to. And so you, you try to get a feel for the deep story. Um, and then you have to put it together uh, by focusing on discrete aspects of the story. Uh, for instance, looking at, um, at the witnesses person by person. Um, and taking apart the evidence um, and then trying to explain why all of this happened. 
Um, because the first question people have is, well, if he's innocent, then how come he's been convicted all these times? How come he's in prison? How come they, they latched onto him in the first place? And you have to have a compelling answer for that. I think one of the big mistakes that defense attorneys often make is they think all they have to do is introduce uh, reasonable doubt into the minds of the jurors and they'll get their person off. That's not true. If the, if the crime is as heinous as the crime that Curtis was accused of, um, the jurors don't want to put a dangerous person back on the street and they will be inclined to convict uh, if, it's a, if, it's, if they see it as a coin toss. So you really have to not just obliterate the state's case, you also have to give uh, some kind of an explanation of why, uh, for instance, Doug Evans in this case, went after Curtis Flowers and why he was wrong to do so. And if you don't do that, you're gonna lose. So you started about uh, working on the Flowers case about uh, two years before the sixth trial, right? Right, uh, just at, towards the end of 2009, Right. Um, I was attending a, an attorney's conference um, that uh, Ray Charles Carter, who was at that time uh, Curtis's lead attorney, uh, was attending. And, and he's the one that reached out to me and asked if I could look at the case. Uh, as always, I said, well, if the family uh, is interested in talking to me, I'd be interested in talking to them. Um, and I got a call back very quickly and uh, went up and talked to uh, Miss Lola. Um, Curtis's mother and uh, and Archie and the rest of the family and it sort of yeah. went from there. Yeah. So as a result of that, you ended up by writing, I think, a lot of blog posts, right? Yeah. Um, about how many did you write? Oh you gosh, it's probably about fifty by now. Um, and there really isn't an aspect of the case I haven't looked at. I started by taking the prosecution's case apart bit by bit. And then I got interested in the question of why Doug Evans got involved in this kind of thing. What, why did he latch on to Curtis? Uh, how, how did this prosecution come apart, come about in the first place? And to do that, I really had to go back into the, the history uh, of uh, not just Winona, but the entire uh, state of Mississippi uh, the civil rights movement in the Mississippi Delta, and especially some of the things that were happening in Grenada, which is the town that Doug Evans grew up in. And I, I, I really wanted to get inside his head because one of the key principles uh, for it doesn't matter what your job is, if you're trying to influence people, you have to understand from the inside the way they look at a case. Uh, and I, I really had to come to grips with the kind of racism that Curtis was referencing early. It is just so deeply embedded, especially in that part of Mississippi, um, that, and, and largely unacknowledged, and a lot of folks are not aware uh, of the extent to which their perception um, is skewed by racial bias. And, and so I think that's certainly true for, for Doug Evans. I, I think- you, he, you, you said one point. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean. That's fine. I was just going to say that I think Doug really did convince himself that he was right. And all the people he was talking to, people like uh, his chief investigator, John Johnson, uh, agreed with him. And so it was just sort of an echo chamber. Everybody right. was listening to each other and reinforcing each other's prejudices. And that's kind of how it all came together. You, you mentioned at one point how uh, you were trying to show how Doug Evans was able to exploit weaknesses in the system. And I thought that was an interesting way of putting it. What, what weaknesses did you, were you talking about there? Well, um, Doug knew, uh, I think, that Curtis was not uh, a known quantity in, in, in white Wydona. Uh, he was quite well known uh, in the black community, primarily for his gospel singing. Um, and of course, there would have been some people in the white community who knew him in that capacity as well. But given the social divide in that part of the world, you really work, I mean, you might work alongside somebody who's of a different race, but chances are when you go home or when you go to church, uh, you're going to be with people who look like you. Uh, and so I think um, Doug realized that 
if he could put all white people on the jury, um, not only would their kind of ingrained uh, racial biases kick in, but the, uh, their social ignorance would kick in. I mean, anybody who knew Curtis personally could not believe that he'd be capable of such an act. Um, and that was certainly true for me. I remember once I, I brought, or in the early days before the trial, I brought a, uh, an attorney from Dallas, a uh, retired attorney, uh, that I knew from the church I was attending at the time. And he was quite convinced that this was a completely, this was just a, they were going down a rabbit hole and it was a waste of time. Uh, so we dropped by the prison. They wouldn't let me in. He was, he was down uh, about 20 miles south of Winona at the time. Uh, and uh, they wouldn't let me visit Curtis, but I said, I sent this, this guy in. And he said, well, it's a waste of time, but I'll go and talk to him. 25 minutes later, he comes back and says, that man is innocent. There's no way he could have done this. <laughs> right, and, right. You know, and that things like that really also, uh, Lola Flowers introduced me to um, one of the prison guards who had worked with Curtis. And he said, that's the finest young man who ever put on a pair of pants. Yeah. And so, you know, um, so what, one what, of the what kind of testimonials really have an influence on you? Yeah. But one of the things that happened, I think, as a result of all these blog posts that you wrote, all the, all the articles that you wrote, and all the research that you did, was that it, it encouraged uh, a lot of publicity from the case. Uh, I think CNN got involved and uh, various other organizations. Could you just talk, talk briefly about how organizations kind of came in but were able to use the material that you'd, you'd written up? Yeah. Without being taken too long, because we have a, I have to <laughs> keep this moving. Yeah. That's right. Well. You you reach out to everybody, uh, the NAACP, uh, the ACLU, uh, various of the uh, innocence projects in New Orleans and also in uh, Mississippi. Um, and I even um, made an appointment to talk to uh, the folks at the Winona uh, newspaper and also uh, the, uh, the paper in, in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, which is sort of uh, the Clarion Ledger is sort of the paper of record for Mississippi and, and tried to get them interested in the case to take a second look at it uh, because they really weren't taking it seriously to that point. Uh, I was able to get a hold of uh, CNN and get them interested. And what you're trying to do is just get people thinking about the case. Because I knew that uh, anybody who took an in-depth look at Curtis's case was going to come to the same conclusion that I came to. Um, and gradually, that's what happened. Right. So by the time the case went up to the Supreme Court, there was a lot of public interest in this, right? Well, in, in certain circles, yes. Um, I think it and, generated enough interest that Sherilyn Johnson and her group at Cornell um, became convinced. They read everything I wrote, and, and I conversed with them a fair bit. They'd occasionally call me and ask me a question. Um, but they did a really good... Um, analysis of, of the legal materials. They became intimately acquainted with the details of every case. And um, they put together a real crackerjack uh, case that they presented to the Supreme Court. Um, and then one thing, one, one of the principles I go by, uh, Michael Curry, who uh, Bishop Michael Curry has recently written a book in which he said, our task is to do our task not to do every task needed for progress to happen. And so, you know, eventually uh, when the In the Dark podcast got involved, uh, they flew out to uh, Arlington, Texas, where I live and spent two days with me. But by the time they got there, they had clearly written, I mean, read everything that I had written. Um, and so they used that as a foundation to build on. And so it's, there's, there's no way that one organization or one individual or one approach uh, can overturn a case like this. It, there's got to be a legal side to it. Uh, there's got to be a media side and, and there's got to be an advocacy group side. Right. But and so uh, on the whole, do you, would you, do, you think it's fair to, do you think it's fair to say that without your storytelling in this case, um, that it probably wouldn't have gotten to the Supreme Court, that they probably wouldn't have given up on the seventh prosecution, and uh, that probably uh, our Curtis Flowers would be dead, would have been executed by now. Yeah, you could say that about my work. I think you could say that about uh, 
the contributions of several other people as well. Right. So I just want to ask you a couple of quick other questions here. Um, where, when, when somebody like Doug Evans goes and uh, flagrantly uh, violates these rules against um, tampering with a jury, basically, and, and uh, using the race card, where do you go to um, get somebody like that dealt with? Should they be should they be prosecuting cases? Are they? Are, isn't this a good example of a of a person that just is simply shouldn't be a prosecutor? Yeah. Well, the legal system assumes good faith on the part of prosecutors, judges, defense attorneys, um, and so what the Supreme Court of Mississippi said to Doug Evans several times is, "You have been guilty of gross, uh, racially motivated malpractice." Here, do it again. <laughs> hand, the, they hand the case back to him, which didn't yep. make a lick of sense. Uh, that's but that's the way the system, I mean, the system cannot address the issue of systemic racism in the criminal justice system. Um, it, that is not have, supposed to exist. Yeah, but shouldn't we have some, some mechanism to get rid of bad prosecutors, prosecutors that don't follow the law? Or, yeah, I, I think if, if there was a uh, prosecutor uh, who flagrantly made some kind of a sexual, um, was guilty of sexual misconduct or misappropriation of funds or who withheld evidence in, in a blatant way, um, you might be able to get that person disciplined by the Bar Association, but probably they would just um, be warned or sanctioned or you know, a little finger waving, that, that would be about it. I don't, I don't think there really is a mechanism. And the All problem right. in the state of Mississippi is that the attorney general, uh, the governor and the prosecutor are all dependent on the same electorate. And that electorate is primarily white and shares the kind of prejudice that the jury and, and Mr. Evans uh, are motivated by. So it, yeah. it's really difficult to get at that for that reason. Yeah. So I have one final question for you, um, and I did. I need a quick answer on it. But uh, you've just written, I think, an article called "If Curtis Didn't Do It, Then Who Did?" Mm -hmm. uh, following up on the issue of uh, who was who actually did this crime, since since clearly Curtis did not. And I think you have a a uh, provocative subject here: the the Birmingham boys. They sound really really bad. Uh, yeah. You want to just quickly talk about it, and then I, I have to move on. Well, just in a nutshell, before and after the crimes in 1996 in Winona, uh, the murder of Bertha Tardy and, and three of her employees, um, there were two, two men, young men, one of them 16 years old, uh, who committed a series of robbery murders in Birmingham. Birmingham is a couple hours to the east of Winona on Highway 82. Uh, there's a couple of roads you can take to get there. Um, and um, these guys, uh, it appears, were in Mississippi at the time of the Tardy murders. That information was withheld from defense counsel. When Curtis went to trial in 2010, his lawyers had never heard of these guys. Um, and Doug Evans, I think, probably learned about them after he had already decided uh, that Curtis was his man, and it was inconvenient. And I don't think he even looked into it. Um, but I think that is probably the best, the most likely, they're the most likely candidates for doing this. And, and just one last thing, the reason I think that this crime was committed was because somebody liked killing people. Um, and there was no there was no rhyme or reason to it. It was not particularly a crime of passion. Um, it was a crime of psychopathy. You know, there was a psychopath. Um, and there aren't very many of those really violent psychopaths around, but all it takes is one. Uh, and un unfortunately for Bertha Tardy and Carmen Rigby and the rest of them, um, the guy showed up on uh, that day and uh, in 1996. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, this has been so very helpful. And I have to say, I have 
tremendous amount of, of respect for what you are doing. And I think we need more such groups. Um, as we talked earlier uh, today, you can see that all of us come to this work because we've all had these kind of experiences in which we have gone out and advocated for people that we thought were treated unjustly. And it becomes a, a calling, it becomes a, a life's work. And I really admire so much what you did. Thank you. So I'm, I have one final person here, Jeff Deskovic. Jeffrey? Yes, yes, Steve, I'm here. Okay, good. Um, so Jeffrey, uh, you were uh, exonerated after 16 years in jail for a murder you did not commit. And then you subsequently went on to earn a master's degree in criminal justice with a thesis on the causes of wrongful prosecutions and prosecutorial misconduct. And then you've just recently been admitted to the bar as a lawyer, correct? Am, am I jumping it or you, you are now admitted to the bar? No, you're correct. Okay. No, I am admitted to the bar. Yes, Steve, I'm yes. an attorney, right. yes. And uh, you've also formed a foundation uh, to work for freeing wrongfully convicted defendants and reforming our criminal justice system. And you've actually been doing amazing work and I, I congratulate you on all of this. So maybe quickly you could go through the history of your case, uh, what happened and, and how uh, misconduct, uh, prosecutorial misconduct uh, impacted it. Sure, um, it was 1990, it was in Westchester County, the suburbs uh, in New York. Uh, I was 16 years old, uh, a classmate uh, was found murdered and raped to, um, I barely knew her, she was simply in a couple of classes, a freshman, one as a sophomore. Uh, I got on the police radar because I was quiet to myself in school and some of the high school um, classmates told the police they might want to look at me or they might want to talk to me because I didn't quite fit in. Uh, another factor is they interpreted my being um, uh, uh, sensitive and emotional um, as being like an outward manifestation. I was sorry for what I um, had done. And uh, lastly, they, put to, they got a psychological profile from the NYPD, which purported to have the psychological characteristics of the actual perpetrator. And I had the misfortune of uh, matching that. So ultimately, um, uh, I was, um, uh, they coerced a false confession out of me. Uh, they took me on a school day across county lines, 40 minutes away by car. And they basically subjected me to the third degree uh, for six and a half to seven hours, including you know, you know threat and, and false promise. And it ended in a, a uh, coerced false confession. Uh, before the trial started, the DNA test didn't match me. I was, um, uh, the prosecutor got the, pro uh, the, the medical examiner to commit misconduct. So he committed fraud and my public defender essentially didn't defend me. And I ended up wrongfully convicted and uh, given a 15 to life sentence. Um, that happened despite a pretrial negative DNA test result. Uh, I lost seven appeals. I got turned down for parole. Ultimately, I got exonerated through further DNA testing through the data bank, which not only uh, reaffirmed uh, my innocence, but it also it also identified the actual perpetrator whose DNA was in the data bank because left free while I was doing time for his trial, and he killed a second victim uh, three and a half years later, a school teacher who had two children. And, and he actually convict, uh, confessed to the crime, right? Yeah, after the DNA matched him. Yes. But by then the gig was up anyway. Right. But I mean, what I'm saying is that, that it is absolutely clear this was, uh, you were not guilty here. Not only did the DNA not match you, it matched him and he confessed to the crime. So now- No, there's no uh, doubt. And in fact, in fact, just to add real, I just wanted to add something just real quick. He was arrested and pled guilty. He was sentenced to the, for the crime. Oh, good. I didn't even realize that. Um, so since you've gone on uh, in the, really in a very credible way to become an expert on uh, misconduct and wrongful convictions. And could you just describe what are the most common forms of prosecutorial misconduct, given, giving us sort of a, 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 a larger view of it. We have a particularly bad situation here in which the prosecutor is, is uh, trying to manipulate the jury, but what other sort of prosecutorial misconduct is there? <laughs> Yeah, sure. In terms of prosecutorial misconduct, in, in my case, I forgot that part of my answer. So basically, one day before officially getting the test DNA test results back from the FBI lab, he ran to the grand jury to indict me so as to not have to present um, the, the DNA results to uh, the grand jury. 
uh, the medical examiner had been complained of in neighboring counties by law enforcement where he was moonlighting as a defense expert. Uh, but then also on the post-conviction level, I, was, I tried to get further DNA testing and, I, and they kept blocking me from doing that. Uh, so that was a, a misconduct in my case. In terms of broader picture, uh, making improper uh, statements in uh, either closing arguments or in their opening statement, uh, withholding evidence is a very common form of, um, of prosecutorial uh, 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 misconduct. Uh, not correcting perjured testimony uh, often happens. Uh, witnesses and the pros prosecutor are supposed to disclose when a witness gets benefits for their testimony. And uh, often some the witnesses who do get benefits, they lie about it. And then the prosecutors are supposed to have a duty to correct untruthful testimony, but they often don't. So those are the, some of the more common forms of, um, of prosecutorial uh, misconduct. Does he, uh, and they also threaten witnesses as well. Uh, let me just say one thing. They often threaten witnesses. Also, witnesses are threatened. Well, you know, if you don't give the testimony then that you that we want, then you're going to find yourself at the defense table. And in the case of a parent, they might threaten uh, the parent that they're going to take the take the child away from them. So, uh, what, what, does the impact of prosecutorial misconduct fall harder on some groups than on others? Have you studied this? Yeah, while wrongful, yeah, I I have sure. I mean, look, while wrongful conviction. Uh, in general, and, and as caused by prosecutorial misconduct cuts across uh, racial lines, it particularly uh, impacts minorities. Uh, for example, uh, uh, African Americans are seven times more likely to be wrongfully convicted of murder. They're three and a half times uh, more likely to be uh, wrongfully convicted of uh, sexual assault. So, and if you were to add up the total number of people who've been wrongfully convicted, you would add you would you would you would arrive at a higher number of minorities than than um, than whites. Um, Black Lives Matter has protested police brutality, but um, would you say that it would be true that this wouldn't happen if prosecutors had credibly prosecuted murders uh, uh, by police officers in the past? In other words, do, does the prosecutor have a a particular effect on police in terms of? Uh, um, preventing uh, some of the worst abuses that we have seen in terms of how police act toward minority groups. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, when you, when, you, when you look at when you look at a lot of the tactics that process underhanded tactics and, and otherwise, I mean, they seem to pull out all the stops when it comes to uh, wrongfully convicting people. But yet, when it comes to prosecuting uh, police officers, they suddenly are inept. They're somehow unable to get an indictment. They're somehow unable to get a conviction. Uh, often when police engage in brutality, uh, their way of getting away with it is charging the person who's been brutalized with assault and just alleging that they, they committed the injury. You know, they, they, um, the injuries they committed on, on the defendant were, were in self-defense, but if the prosecutor and it's the prosecutors who bring those charges, it's the prosecutors who prosecute those cases. But if they were to stop doing that, if they were to start prosecuting police officers who engage in brutality, if they would start prosecuting cops who engage in unjustifiable deadly police force, I mean, even at times, officers who are caught on tape, you know, using unjustifiable deadly police force, if the prosecutors were to start prosecuting them, that would send a clear signal that, look, buddy, we got a zero tolerance policy here and you've been given a badge and a gun and authority and responsibility. And if you dare to abuse that, we're gonna come down really hard on you. And instead, the when they don't do that, and that's the general case now, and that, that's why you know people are uh, up in arms, rightfully so, about police misconduct, that establishes uh, the culture and the norms that the police just engaging, becoming the lawbreakers uh, themselves. You know, I really like the theme of, uh, of today's program, it's not just the police, because remember, as much as we need police reform, we, we need it on the prosecutors as well. It's, it's the prosecutors who engage in the tactics that I, that I just discussed. It's the prosecutors who seek to admit unlawfully gathered evidence. When the police engage in uh, searches that are not supported by probable cause, it's the prosecutors who go ahead and use that evidence rather than rejecting it. It's the prosecutors who use uh, identifications through unfair lineups and photo arrays, even if it's suggestive, it's them who are using it as evidence. 
it's the prosecutors who are using confessions despite uh, the presence of, re of, of, of red flags that this confession might be coerced, it might be untrue. So what are the projects you're working on now with your foundation? Yeah, so my, my foundation, we're, we're trying to pass the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct. Uh, you know, we, we spoke early in the program, it was said by other panelists just working together and working in coalition. So my organization, Jeffrey Deskwick Foundation, we're part of a, of a bigger coalition called It Can Happen to You, which um, I'm an advisory board member of and which you're part of as well. And we have chapters in uh, New York, Pennsylvania and California. So right now, relative to prosecutorial misconduct, we're uh, close to passing what's called the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct in New York. So it's an independent oversight board, which would have power of, of, of subpoena. They would have the expertise uh, needed. Complaints could be anonymous, which is important because many defense lawyers do not file complaints because they're worried about repercussions, both to them as well as uh, future clients. And so far as they fear that plea bargains that might otherwise be extended would, would, be, would be withheld. So we're working on passing that in New York. We actually have passed it previously in 2018 and 2019. Uh, District Attorney Association of New York, they didn't want to have any oversight. So they brought a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the, convict, of the um, commission. The judge rejected all their arguments, but did find a problem in the appeal procedure. So we're in the process of repassing that now, taking into account the judge's decision. So we've passed it in the assembly. We're working on getting it passed in the New York State Senate. Um, we're working on getting that passed in Pennsylvania and California as well. So that's the first thing that we're trying to do. Uh, but I think that additional steps which could curtail prosecutorial misconduct would involve removing what's referred to as prosecutorial immunity, which is a dastardly doctrine which states that no matter how egregious the prosecutorial misconduct is, if it's happened after an arrest has taken place, then the prosecutor has immunity, so you can't hold them accountable. I tried to hold the prosecutor accountable in my civil suit for what he did, but that portion of my claim got dismissed based on that. So I think that removing the immunity would be big step. Uh, police don't have immunity. Uh, forensic scientists don't have immunity. They're not hindered from doing their job. And so the argument that's always trotted out that we want prosecutors to have a free reign in, in prosecuting cases uh, that doesn't hold any water to me. We don't need to have a class of citizens that are above the law by way of their profession. So removing the immunity would be another thing. And criminalizing clear-cut intentional prosecutorial misconduct, uh, I, I think, would be a really big uh, deterrent, particularly when it results in a, a conviction of someone who's innocent and evidence of innocence has been withheld. Uh, that that's, that's a way, it's not often thought of this way, but it is a form of obstructing justice. And lastly, if there was a uh, rule that would allow automatic reversal of any conviction in which prosecutorial misconduct happened, then I think in totality, all those things would go a long way to prevent prosecutorial misconduct. So right now, if you're a defendant and you've been found guilty, it's not, and the court agrees that there has been misconduct in your case, that's not the end of it. You don't get an automatic new trial. Instead, the court then looks at whether or not the misconduct was harmless or not, meaning they try to determine if you would have been found guilty anyway. And, and if they answer that question by saying yes, then you would not get a reversal. Whereas I think it's clear that uh, once misconduct has happened, it affects the lens from which the rest of the case is viewed. It alters how the case turns out. Uh, and I don't think you can look back in hindsight and say whether or not someone would have been found guilty or not. Uh, I categorically reject the idea uh, of harmless error because if it was harmless, and everyone's going to get this, right? We don't got to be legal beagles on this. If it was harmless, the prosecutor wouldn't have bothered engaging in it. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, Alan, and, and uh, can I go back to you for a minute? And uh, just ask you, did uh, did what you hear, does that sort of ring a bell in terms of the kind of misconduct you've seen in uh, as you've gone through these cases? Uh, yes, very, very much so. Um, I think the issue of, of withholding evidence um, is, is a major one, uh, but um, 
I think there, everything that, that Jeffrey mentioned is, is critically important. I think he did a really good job of, of summarizing uh, the changes that need to be made. Okay, good. And, and Curtis, uh, what do you think? Uh, does this sound like uh, some reforms that need to be made within the system? Yes, yes it does. Uh, Jeffrey was spot on. Yes. Good. I'm, I, I'm hoping that the three of you will have some conversations down the road because I would love to see some of this, some of these reform movements start to spread across the country. Yes. Um, at this point, uh, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to say? Uh, we'll start with you, Jeffrey. You got any, any final thoughts that you want to say? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do. I, I want to say that it's very important that everybody works together in coalition. I, I think that the era of going it alone is over. It, it wasn't all that effective to begin with. Strength in numbers. If there's many of us working together, then we're harder to ignore. Uh, it's great to have teammates, which is why I like working in coalition. If you can establish a statewide coalition, you can demonstrate the the desire, the want of citizens of having criminal justice reform, having a more accurate system. Um, so, and really the, the politicians seldom do anything, uh, do the, so the politicians seldom do anything that's right simply because it's right. It's only when it's linked to getting votes and getting reelected that they're finally gonna do something. So if we don't work together, they're gonna, it's gonna continue to be status quo. So hence working in, in, uh, in, in coalition, uh, and, and the thing I want to, uh, I'll close with this. Um, look, it can happen to you, man. It could happen to you. You know, I, I, I had never been arrested by, for anything. I was not a high school dropout. I was actually on my way to school uh, when this happened. You know, this cuts, you know, while it particularly impacts minorities, it clearly cuts across uh, racial lines and everybody has a stake in it. And, and at the end of the day, when you wrongfully convict somebody, uh, whether through prosecutorial misconduct or any other cause, you not only send them to prison, but you send their family. But in a larger sense, you also leave the you also leave uh, society in danger because the actual perpetrator is free, and and they're able to strike again. And that that's that's what happened in my case. So if anyone would like to see more about my advocacy work, if you have Amazon Prime, there is a documentary short out called uh, Conviction, which has more about. Uh, my advocacy and life post exoneration. Um, thank you to all the people who work behind the scenes to make this happen and, and for giving me a, a few minutes on, on the platform just to share thoughts. Thank you, Jeffrey. Alan, do you have some, some thoughts, final thoughts? Oh, you're, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself? I yeah. muted myself because I was holding my grandson. Um, who is that cute guy, by the way? That is Micah. He is the first son, my first grandson. He's a, the uh, son of uh, Lydia Bean. You met Lydia uh, in the LaFleur prison during the trial, Curtis. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, and they tried a long time to get that child. Uh, just like Curtis tried a long time and, and it took a lot of faith. So if, if you have been the victim of wrongful prosecution uh, or a loved one has, I would just encourage you not to give up. Uh, and don't worry if your little actions um, don't seem to be adequate. They probably aren't, but do what you can do and reach out to as many people as you can, get as many groups as you possibly can involved. Jeffrey talked about the importance of networking and that, that's critical. But I think um, faith, if, if you are a person of faith, uh, just really, latch on to, to God and believe that good things are going to happen. Um, you have to keep believing. And that's, I think, one of the things that was a critical factor in Curtis's case. He never quit believing, nor did his family. And um, it just took 23 years, but it happened. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, uh, Curtis, you got any final, th final thoughts? I think Jeffrey and Alan said it all, but I, I would, once again, like to say, never give up. I want to thank everyone for having me and, and chance to tell my story and love you Curtis, all. I find it hard to believe it, it, that you never, never gave up. Is that true? Is that really true that you always believed something was going to happen that gets you out of this? Always believe. 
Well, you're one special guy for sure. Um, I think you're going to go on and have a beautiful life, and I'd love to work with you. Uh, if you'd like support from the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation uh, and, and work, we'd we'll love to work with you. We'd love to work with all of you down there. Also from It Could Happen to You, uh, Project Salam, uh, CCF, all of the coalition partners. I mean, we would love to work with anybody that's interested. And, and I think, as you know, uh, reform issues work much better when they come locally, when they start start with people on the spot. Uh, we can always get help from CCN and other groups and they can come in and, and do things. But uh, it always starts down locally with people that say, I've had enough, I wanna make a change. I, this is not gonna work. So thank you all very much. Before you leave, I just had one little thing I wanted, one final observation I wanted to make myself if you'll bear with me for a minute. Uh, in closing, I would like to offer one final observation. CCF's mission is to protect our civil freedoms, to improve and reform our criminal justice system and advocate for Muslims and others unfairly charged and convicted in the war on terror. We are presently advocating for some 200 wrongfully convicted prisoners who were targeted by the FBI and convicted in federal court, essentially because they were Muslim in much the same way that the Black Panthers and others were targeted in the 1970s with an FBI program known as COINTELPRO. We stand in solidarity with all those who are trying to eradicate improper discriminations of any kind. As a society, we need to do a better job of demanding accountability of prosecutors who inject improper discriminations in court proceedings, regardless of what state or federal court the discrimination occurs. CCF has proposed congressional legislation to help to correct the problems on a federal level. And we stand ready to work with any group who seeks to hold prosecutors accountable for their misconduct. So thank you for listening. And we hope to do more on this subject soon. You guys are great. Beautiful. Thank you.